To all gamers out there, tell me, what makes a keyboard gaming nowadays? RGB backlighting? A Windows lock key? And key rollover? Anti-ghosting? An addition of bloatware software? On the surface, yes. Besides the ridiculous marketing, it has been this way pretty much since the inception of the term gaming keyboard. <sighs> but now, so let's, let's talk, talk about real, real innovation. innovation. As we all know, keyboards usually operate digitally, either being pressed or not when typing. And with the majority of contact-based switches, like Cherry Switches and the numerous clones, this is the case. But not this board. See, this is what's called an analog keyboard, something different and unique on the inside than what you're typically used to coming across. Let me ask you, have you ever seen a keyboard that can rapidly trigger a key? Is capable of functioning like a controller to move in a precise manner? Or can bind four key combinations on a single stroke? And dare I say it, is possibly the fastest keyboard on the market? Well, my friend, prepare to wrap your mind around this keyboard. As someone who has undoubtedly been containing his excitement for over 10 months, and with setback after setback, I present the Wooting 2 HE. This week, we announced the Wooting 2 HE. Wooting 2 HE? Where's the HE, Kevin? Yeah, lots of good HE boys waiting for their good HE. Mm -hmm. Long-awaited Wooting 2 HE update. This marks the first Wooting 2 HE update. Very excited to share what's going on. Finally. So what do I mean by analog keyboard? Well, unlike most other gaming keyboards, it's capable of sensing how far you press a key at varying actuation points due to the different switch design, which I will explain later. But basically, if you ever find yourself making accidental key presses or the switches are a little too sensitive, you can just move down the actuation point until it doesn't happen anymore, allowing you to keep that comforting lightweightness feel and retain that fast actuation. Unique to this kind of board is the ability to register a varying range of analog inputs as opposed to traditional on or off outputs. So for example, if you want to walk slowly or turn the corner more smoothly in a car, you can just push down the key slightly and then more so to go full speed. And that's the beauty of analog input. There's not just one area of input, there's an entire field of input that can be contained in any manner you wish. But don't worry, this keyboard can still act like a normal digital keyboard when you need it to. In the utility, you can enable what's called digital keys or keyboard keys, which will allow you to output keyboard keys when typing. So you can think of it as a three-in-one device similar to the SwiftPoint Z mouse that I talked about before. A keyboard, Xbox controller, and a joystick, all in one device. Now one crucial thing I must preface is that not all games will support this feature in the same way. Yet. It will heavily depend on the game you are playing, if it supports X input or direct input, and multiple device inputs. See my SwiftPoint video for an explanation of those two terms. But don't worry. Over the years, the Wooten community and Wooten themselves have done a tremendous amount of work in analyzing whether most games, popular or not, are analog compatible. And with the utility, you can use the gamepad mode selection, updated from their older version, to have the keyboard only use one game interface, either X input, direct input, or none, acting as a normal keyboard to prevent any potential interference with games. Although most games nowadays use X input, you can still use direct input if you're a retro gamer, a user of auto hotkeys, a Mac or Linux user, or for compatibility reasons. So most of the work is already complete, just needing to be set up. When you have everything set up, both in the software and in game, you'll start to feel that analog control that you would get on a keyboard. Precise movements, but now with more options. The keyboard is technically plug and play with the included three analog profiles without the software, but the gamepad mappings are spread out across the three, so it's really only for demonstration purposes. Anyways, after configuring it in the software, I want to show you guys its capabilities with the games I feel interested to try it on. In my demonstrations, both with working games and not, I will show the gameplay first with an Xbox Elite Series 2 controller, and then with the Wooting 2 HE, so you can see for yourself what I mean by analog control, whilst also having the gamepad mappings, tester, and analog curve presets from the software to show what's going on underneath the HE. I will say in advance that games on Steam that claim to have full controller support are irrelevant, as I've come across games that have partial support and work just fine, and ones with full control support that don't work at all. Let me show you what I mean. Minecraft was the first game I decided to try it on, and of course, by nature, Java Edition doesn't support controller input no matter what I tried. So in this instance, the only way to get analog input operational was through modding with Minecraft Forge and having to have the correct controller selected. And the results after a couple of tweaks were mostly successful with the exception of the UI being glitchy. 
The analog controls definitely were a gradual, smooth and precise increase when walking slowly compared to a normal keyboard, and you can bet this won't be the only time I use those words. I can imagine moments where you need to carefully sneak and move around being much more intuitive with this. Though if I'm being honest, this is probably best left in non-PVP survival game modes. Not that it's useless or anything, it works, but due to the fast paced nature of Minecraft PvP, the effects in a fight would be inconsequential at worst, and minimal at best. And it's not like you can use this normally anyway. Having said that, Microsoft Windows 10 Edition supposedly states to support controller input, with additional evidence according to the Wooten compatibility list, so I guess if you want to try analog controls in Minecraft, that would be your best bet. I'll pray that one day that Java Edition obtains native controller support, if ever. Battlefield 1 was an interesting case. Because of how the game functions, there need to be three separate profiles for on foot, ground vehicles, and especially piloting. Other than that, the analog control inputs here were seamless and smooth like the analog graph. It works! With very minimal Roblox like rebinding keys, the difference between a normal keyboard is substantial. Piloting a plane in Battlefield 1 has never felt more natural and better with a keyboard. This is one of those games where analog input enhances the gameplay in my opinion. Being able to perfectly line up your shots, sneak around and surprise your enemies, and control your vehicles with precise movements. Besides the occasional UI controller bugginess, I definitely say that the good far outweighs the bad here. In GTA 5, it was a special case where analog controls were only functional in driving and piloting so the profile creator cannot work with walking on foot whatsoever. This does mean that when you find yourself wanting to drive with analog controls, you'll have to get in the habit of utilizing the dedicated profile keys to switch back and forth between digital and analog, otherwise you'll end up not being able to walk forward properly. But besides that, being able to go back and forth between digital and analog in a video tutorial later means I can confidently state that the analog integration here is seamless too, Besides the UI bugs, it works. Evolve some ears. Controlling a car feels a lot more natural when you want to turn in a more controlled manner with the weight of your fingers. Same thing in a helicopter too, with substantial effects. You can't even access this plane of control with a normal keyboard. If you're the type of person that really likes to drive around in particular, this will help for sure. Same thing with Battlefield One. With specific controls, analog input improves the experience here. One of the more niche games I wanted to try this on was Generation Zero, an atmospheric survival game where you loot and battle against killer robots in Sweden. With some minor tweaking from setting the actuation point all the way at the bottom, I found the transition to analog controls to be natural for this kind of game because it's the kind of game that leads itself to a lot of sneaking around in a careful manner from robots and players, and having that option means you can make more concise movements and line up your shots more accurately. Overall, I'd say this is another game that greatly benefits from analog input. The controls really changed the experience of Battlefield 1. I found the linear curve to work the best here. Another game I thought this would work perfectly with was Sniper Early 4, where being able to sneak around slowly and surprise attack your enemies would be really useful. However, this is one of those cases where the game has analog controls, but has it in a very stepped manner, as you can see with the analog curve. So when you try to transition from walking to running, you'll come across a sudden snap or on or off switch in movement, which kind of interrupts the smooth increase. But this isn't an issue with the board, more so with how the game is coded. Don't get me wrong, it works, the analog controls help the experience, it's just one you have to get accustomed with. Nevertheless, a stealth game such as this can be played normally, but is slightly enhanced with analog input for sure. Just like with Generation Zero, 
I thought this would work perfectly with Alien Isolation. Needing to carefully sneak around those bastards, otherwise game over, man! However, it turned out to be... impossible. See, this is one of those games where the game is coded not to support multiple device inputs. So what will happen is that when you go to move with controller bindings, it locks you into controller inputs and therefore loses mouse input, and vice versa with keyboard and mouse input locking you out of controller inputs. So it doesn't work really. And ironically enough, it's a game that stays to have full controller support. Therefore, I'll say that without modding, this is an example where you pick either one or the other. Trying it out on Bioshock, I will say I had my hopes up that it would work with it saying to have full control support, but sadly I was mistaken and disappointed. <sighs> Just like Alien Isolation, it locks you into one input even when you enable the gamepad option, so again you'll have to take your pick with one or the other, unless you know how to mod or perhaps work around the issue with DKS, otherwise you're sore out of luck. Next, I wanted to try it with Doom Eternal, and oh boy, I spent way too much time trying to configure the analog curve to produce a smooth enough progression. By which I mean yes, this game with the gamepad option on, and sending the actuation points for WASD all the way at the bottom, allows for multiple device inputs, and it appears to have the same stepped analog progression like Sniper Elite 4. I found the modified version of the aggressor preset to work fittingly well. Although, the effort and effects of using analog controls with a game like this is pretty much inconsequential. Most, if not all the time you spend running around at full speed, not exactly needing to move slowly. So this kind of situation can be summed up as a game that supports analog controls, but the effects of such controls are not beneficial in most cases. Still, it's there if you're interested. A very reputable title, The Witcher 3, had for the most part a seamless integration with control support. And the best part was that someone kindly had a profile for this game already on the Wooter base, so I only needed to copy the code and bind the controller inputs. Now, besides the usual UI bugs, it seems to lend itself quite well with analog controls, allowing you to fight enemies in a more controlled manner, and especially riding horses in the same manner too. Just see for yourself. It's also one of those titles that has a stepped analog progression, much like Sniper Elite and Doom. But funny enough, I kind of found that the analog controls can be interrupted by moving slightly to the left or right, so I don't know what's up with that. Regardless, the gameplay with analog input works next to perfect. Just make sure you have the keyboard set to slot 1 and disable Xbox configuration support to remove the permanent Xbox bindings on the UI. And lastly, Call of Duty Warzone and by proxy Modern Warfare 2019. Essentially, this game is exactly like Alien Isolation. You have to pick either controller or keyboard from the input device settings and stick with it once in game. And I'm unsure if money could get it to work either. So you gotta make a choice of either one. Though I can kind of understand why this is the case because of the unfair advantage a keyboard and mouse have over a controller. Though, I do find it confusing that they have cross-platform support while having both controller types separate. With their past games like Black Ops 3, they did in fact support multiple device inputs. But saying that, with DKS for example, you could kind of alleviate this problem with false analog movement by running with only one button press and other actions readily on one keystroke. So if anything, that is your next best bet for analog movement in this game. Looks like pretty cool stuff, am I right? But as I mentioned before, it isn't universally applicable with everything you throw at it. So why is this the case? Well, here's what I brainstormed. 1. Because of the still popular and relevant cherry switches and their clones in keyboards, especially in custom ones. 2. Lack of consumer awareness. 3. Lack of care because it's not mainstream, yet still seen as a gimmick. 4. Because of how expensive it is to implement. 5. Because of how hit or miss it can be with games. Big calls in my opinion. And 6. Because this board is only sold on their official store page. So for such a recent feature being brought to keyboards, this still has a long way to go, to being acknowledged. But how about we bring it back a little and talk about the creators. Who is this company who has produced this arguably outstanding creation? Just who is this company, Wooting? Well, chances are that you mostly don't know about this small five-man group. In short, Wooting is a small Dutch company from the Netherlands who quote, 
got fed up with the gaming stereotype and terrible customer communication by gaming companies and decided to set up their own company that challenges the status quo with their analog keyboards. They've recorded the journey meticulously in their About Me page, which if I may add already shows how transparent they are. They first began a Kickstarter in 2016 for arguably the first ever analog keyboard to produce in-game effects, the Rooting One, with 885 backers and without any prior experience. Over time, they made several improvements from this board with the Rooting Two in 2018, arguably more or less the same as the One. But as Adomax didn't want to work on improving their switches, they started to explore other input technologies while developing the Rooting Two which later turned into a huge leap in analog capabilities with the introduction of the Wooting 2 Leica Edition in 2019, with their very own Hall Effect Switch design called the Leica Switch. And this is what would be used in the Wooting 2 HE announced in October of 2020. The Leica Switches on a technical level are superior to the Flaretech Switches with exclusive perks that I will get to in a bit later. The HE is practically the same build as their previous Wooting 2 and the Leco Edition, without the exclusive dice of PPT keycaps, packaging, and small insignificant changes. Their overarching goal is to make analog keyboards the industry standard and have open communication and transparency at the core of their company. Which you can see on their social media accounts, like on their YouTube channel with wonderful insights on keyboard manufacturing through their past vlogs, their Twitch streams that contain a lot of juicy developments on upcoming projects, updates, and Q&As, their developer blogs and newsletters that go ham on jargon and in-depth information, and their Reddit and Discord that have a helpful and friendly customer support and a wonderful thriving community who can assist you if you run into any problems. Convinced to buy one, perhaps? If you are, this is what you get in the packaging. The, of course, gorgeous board itself with a very useful blister for protection, an optional ABS keycap set in a separate packaging, apparently due to dealing with more specific language support, specifically ISO languages, a braided Type-C to A cable, notably the same one that comes with their Leica edition, quite durable I must say, a useful wired keycap puller, four spare linear Leica switches in case one breaks, and one of their unique postcards as a thank you that comes with all their keyboards. A nice gesture I might add. So generally, I'd say you're getting a generous amount of accessories alongside the board. The packaging did leave a bit to be desired for me as there were no feelings, but as long as it arrived in one piece, which it did, that is what matters to me. Let's start with the exterior of the board and work our way towards the interior. The build cord is made of sandblasted aluminium 5052 with an embossed Wooting logo in the middle that blends into the background. So notably the same as on their previous Wooting 2 and similar to what other premium gaming keyboards use at this price point. Just be sure to wipe off those revolting grease and oil stains from your fingerprints. While not spill proof and heavy, it has rigidity and good durability. This makes it weigh just under a kilogram at 950 grams, so pretty average for a modern board. And measurements come up to about 460mm in length, 150mm in width, and 39mm in height. When you take out these certain keycaps, you'll see 15 unobstructed screws that can be unobstructively unscrewed with a Phillips screwdriver in case you need to get under the hood. The chassis with holds the switches in a floating switch design, which has its fans. Although granted, it doesn't really protect the switches when compared to a high profile design, and is more of a design that favors RGB lovers and for cutting costs on material production. Not to mention it makes board chow like dandruff and hair pieces very noticeable. Although it is relatively easy to clean off because of it, so I'll give it that. Speaking of the floating switch design, their old Kickstarter page on the Wooting 2 called the same kind of design the KISS, no not the band, KISS design, as in keep it simple stupid, which boasts about the low profile design. However, knowing how much times have changed since then, I can understand why they did that. Personally, I would have preferred the decision to have a sturdier chassis, but knowing that would have jacked up the price, I can understand why not. Turning it over, the bottom case is apparently a mixture of ABS and polycarbonate, in case you're wondering. Located here are two snappy flip-out feet to raise it up an inch, a total of eight rubber grip feet, and has a Type-C connection with a three-way cable gutter. Quite convenient if you ask me. Just be careful with these plastic holders, I believe it's a well-known issue for them to snap off over time depending on the size of the cable. Speaking of power cables, it is recommended not to use a USB hub for insufficient power reasons and instead is favorable to connect it to either a USB 2.0 or 3.0 port at the back of your desktop. And going off on a tangent for a moment, I find it very charming for the wound team to have their signatures underneath this statement. Don't worry guys, 
I have for sure been taking care of this girl. She is annihilating them digital keyboard gamers. <laughs> Elaborating on the switches, I will say if you've ever tried any of the other similar modern high-end contactless switches like Optic switches, Razer optical switches, and OmniPoint switches, you'll probably know what I mean when I say these feel smooth AF, which is by design. And in case you're wondering, yes, these are lubed straight out of the factory, which apparently helps to absorb the impact noise in the experience. For stock switches, they do sound a bit high pitched and less bassy due to the aluminum build and APS keycaps. Though personally, I find it satisfying as someone more into switch feel than to switch sound. I'll showcase both of these in the typing test in a bit. As someone who has come from the Apex Pro, this feels just like them. And honestly, I knew my hunch was right when I went to find out what the force code for the only point switches was. I knew that the Leica switches felt a bit stiffer when comparing the force code side by side. Also, I've heard these switches solved the binding issues on off-center key presses on their old flare tech switches, and I've tried looking for any binding. And while they did say that, my K key switch does bind ever so slightly when I push it more on the left side. But thankfully with these switches being hot swappable, this isn't really an issue. I do find that if you slowly press the key off-center, there was a kind of snapping effect. Like the magnets underneath come together, and when you release it, it comes back into place, creating an interrupted linear release transition. I don't know if this is intentional, and luckily none of this happens on center key presses, but it's definitely a thing. Other than that, these switches are simply as Dutch people would say, lecker. Like seriously, here's what I was using before, a cheap Acer rubber dome board and a clicky laptop keyboard if that counts. And as the only boards I have to compare it with, the difference is night and day. Like in every sense of the word, I don't think I can be playing without switches like these ever again. Shedding some light on these switches, they were developed by Wooting themselves under Wooting Technologies. And these have a bit of a shifted history. See, originally, they started developing this with the help of Huano from one of their existing switches. However, later on, they hastily swapped to Gatron once the SteelSeries exclusivity deal elapsed because they were not being cooperative with producing the exact specifications they were looking for. Not having full analog range, not being hot swappable, and a slightly heavier 65 gram end force. You can visibly see the changes that were made when you compare the two different designs side by side. Gatron was also the same company that produced the SteelSeries only point switches, and when you look at the two different designs side by side, you can see the resemblance. So, in a way, you could classify the Leica switches as a distant cousin to the OmniPoint switches. Anyway, collaborating with Gatron, Wooting had two priorities with these switches. One, needing to make progress with analog input technology. And two, not making this something exclusive in the long term, as they wanted to lower the entry barrier for analog input switches for keyboard makers, hobbyists, and third parties, with support for other makers to make an analog input keyboard and provide the tools required. I can certainly think of one that comes to mind. Hmm. Anyways, these are what Wooten calls the Lekker switch, Lekker being a common word used in the Netherlands to mean delicious, tasty, luscious, or even sexy, which I can vouch for with these switches. These are a contactless, whole effect linear switch, as you can see from this convenient force curve on their website, and what I mean by this is that it has a magnet attached to the bottom of the switch, and below the PCB is a magnet sensor, and essentially, the closer the magnet gets to the sensor, the stronger the signal, aka key presses, which in this case is what makes this fundamentally analog and have access to the full analog range with no debounce delay at all. This is how it works on a general level. But if you want to thoroughly know the inner works of this switch, I'd highly recommend watching Thomas, aka, forgive me, Heels Run 22 Switch Teardown video on the Leica switch. His knowledge on keyboards far exceeds mine and he'll be able to tell you more than I could. Also, if I haven't mentioned it yet, the board cannot be decked out with any other variant switch types from the likes of Cherry, Gatron, KL, Omron, or Flaretech. Basically anything that is not this Leica switch. But why would you want to anyway? These being a whole effect switch means that I can assure you that these are very reliable with a lifespan of 100 million key presses compared to almost everything out there. In fact, this figure should be much higher as whole effect switches are virtually indestructible, hence why these days you can find whole effect keys in industries that require high reliability such as aerospace, underwater devices, and the military. If you didn't know, it usually takes about a whole year just to test 100 million key presses. Quite the testing period, I know. But Honey, a switch manufacturer with their very own Hall Effect switches, have measured them to get as high as 30 billion key presses. So that should just put into context just how reliable and long-lasting these switch types are. You're set for life! 
The key and first weight is measured at 60 centinewtons. If I were to compare it to the common linear switch, Cherry MX Reds, they'd feel a bit stiffer with a starting weight at 40 grams compared to Cherry's 30 grams. The actuation point can be readily set from 0.1 millimeters to 4 millimeters. Yes, you heard me right. Starting from as little as 0.1 millimeters. More than the Apex Pro, every Cherry Switch Plus clones, and I go so far to say it's the first of its kind. Although, if you're thinking you can game at that sensitivity, I'd think twice about that. It's so sensitive, it will go off at the merest wiggle of your fingers. But hey, prove me wrong. Another handy feature these switches have, unlike other current Hall Effect keyboards, <coughs> the Apex Pro, is hot swappability, so no desoldering is required to replace a broken switch. Forgive me for my struggles. And in case you're asking, no, these will not work with their previous Wooting 1 and 2 keyboards for they use a different mold and PCB. The bottom case is made of what Wooting calls milky white to diffuse the RGB light around the case so that it will line up like a Leco piece of candy, allowing the light to be visible even if you use non-backlit keycaps. Kinda like, say, Cherry MX RGB brown switches. If you're into rainbows, you'll enjoy this light show. Finally, the stem it uses is MX compatible for universal compatibility, so don't worry, you are free to add in your own keycaps if desired. Speaking about the keycaps, the stock ones, if you ordered any, that come with the board are known as laser bladed ABS. These ones cost around 40 Australian dollars and are available in ANSI and ISO, which I will say have a very clean and normal font. None of those edgy gamer fonts or legends, very nice design. And that Wooting Windows key kind of gives the board a timeless look and personality, if you know what I mean. In case you're wondering why the characters are centered, the LEDs are located in the center of the PCB, so that's why. When it's fresh, it looks clean, but by design, the legends will wear off and become all shiny after mere weeks. Not to mention it's highly susceptible to grease and fingerprint marks, as you can probably see. That is why, whether during the ordering process or not, if you decide to pay extra like me, Wooting offers a separate branded set of standard and affordable double shot shine through PBT keycaps called Blank, an ODM product for 49 Australian dollars. These offer a more durable keycap set and have seamless legends as a bonus. These ones don't have the same quick wearing out property that the ABS caps have, and are a combination of the most durable material and printing method, so you can expect these ones to last much longer. There are, however, small but noticeable black marks that don't let the backlight through like so, but that is a byproduct of shine through PBT sets. Also, for some reason on my blank PBT set, there were tiny plastic flake residues on the bottom of some keycaps. It created a bit of a mess, but it was easy to clean off by plucking and wiping them off. For the most part, it's acceptable. Though apparently, because of the design limitations of Shine Through PPT, they stated that they are working on their own branded Double Shot PPT set, so that'll be something to look forward to. The keycap profile on both keycap sets are sculpted OEM, simply meaning the height and angle vary on each row, as you can see on this comparison chart of common keycap profiles. And these are MS compatible, so you are free to put these on your existing board, including the Wooting 1 and 2 boards if you have them. At the moment, I don't have them on because I want to show you all exactly what you're getting without paying for any additional extras. But for the sake of clarity, here's the HE with them on with some RGB effects.
The differing sound signatures are due to the two keycap sets being made out of different materials. The ABS set sounds stocky and has more of a deep sounding signature compared to the PPT set, which has a higher pitch sound signature. If it interests you, they are 29 euros on the international store and 29 US dollars on the US store. I will add that if you decide to purchase the PBT set, it will replace the ABS keycap set if any are already on the board. So if you still want the ABS set alongside the PBT set, you will have to purchase them separately, which is what I resorted to doing for this video. So bear that in mind. Also, they've shown to have the same PBT set with inverse die sub Panton accents like on the Switch stem. However, they are only available in German ISO, but I can confirm they will eventually be available in US ANSI as well. Unique to Wooding's ABS design keycaps are three onboard analog profiles located here, marked with A1 to A3, and a mode key that is very useful for toggling between the one digital profile and the last used analog profile. There are also unique functions with the functions key that come on every board, such as function plus media keys located on the control keys, function plus print screen and pause for LED brightness, function plus mode key to toggle the function lock, and function plus windows to disable the windows key. All these are configurable in the software The Utility, where you can set up a plethora of other keyboard shortcuts or change the existing ones to something else entirely. The wrist rest that I got alongside the keyboard for a 10% discount is pretty much what they advertise it as. A firm surface that doesn't make my wrist sink into it, but while having a soft, but admittedly grippy, touch to it. It most certainly is quite flexible. Look at that. And it's not magnetic, not that it needs to be, and can easily be placed under most keyboards, except maybe for some membrane and low profile ones. Or you touch typists will find this helpful. But don't worry about it potentially moving around when you're using it. It has a natural anti-slip bottom in a Cairo pattern to prevent it from doing that. It's entirely made out of silicone, meaning it's very skin friendly, doesn't degrade, and has a lifetime durability. And while it does admittedly easily contract messes like dust particles, dandruffs, and food crumbs all around, it's washable with running water alone, unlike those wrist wraps from big companies that have those RGB strips along the sides of it. You can even chuck that bad boy in a washing machine if it gets too nasty, because it's completely waterproof, because there isn't anything to damage. It comes in black and midnight blue, both for full size, 10 keyless, and 60% sizes. And in the future, could have more colors available like they did before with concrete gray, so that'll be something to look forward to. Now, let's head on inside to the interior of the board. Just like any other keyboard with the word gaming in it, it's capable of displaying an ostentatious amount of RGB per key with 16.8 million colors at your disposal, or through the six lightning zones with the help of the Switch's milky white bottom case. Within the utility, you can customize them from the color bar here, change the lock light colors, set presets, or use your mouse by pressing and or holding the left button to select a color, like so. And the same thing with the right button to select a color on the board, like so. Or if you just want some flashy effects, underneath the keyboard model is where you'll find the RGB effects, in case you care. And to the right of it is where you can adjust the brightness and change to a color preset. My two favorite ones are the Lekka and the standard rainbow one. The light bundling is pretty balanced I'd say, with single key lines retaining to themselves at 100%, and the light blading isn't as bad and is reasonable to gain with respectively in my opinion. Though at 100% it is quite garish, but full. During my testing, 100% white, or 255, 255, 255, does appear a little pinkish, but when the brightness is set to around 70, it does in fact look relatively white. Personally, I use RGB less for visual expression and more so as a guide for my eyes to determine when I bind it to what keys. I'm not much of a stickler for RGB, but if you are, and miraculously own a Razer mouse, the utility supports Razer Chroma Connect if you're in the Razer ecosystem perhaps, but only when syncing the effects I hear. As I mentioned before, this keyboard supports varying actuation points that is adjustable both per key and globally. So here in the utility, it's as simple as moving the horizontal bar up and down for a general adjustment, like so, or selecting this button to set them per key, which is fantastic, like so. There we go. 
These keyboards are shipped with the actuation point set from 0.3 millimeters to 3.8 millimeters. You can remove these dead zones in the software, but be warned, you may have an unstable experience. This kind of feature also goes hand in hand with this feature right next to it, which is in fact a brand new, never before seen feature, as far as I know, called Rapid Trigger. Wooten themselves describe it as being able to repeat a press key mid-motion at any point of the travel without needing to surpass a fixed reset or actuation point. So TLDH, the key turns off when you retract it and on when you press it while still having it pressed down. The gift they have expresses this quite well. And before I forget to mention, this is for every key on the board, not per key as of right now. Having the value higher will require less release force to reset and vice versa for a lower value. Let me show you in person with an effect. I found that this sort of function can make spamming keys a whole lot easier, especially in games with those quick time events. It pairs up well with DKS with the right setup too. Beyond that, I'd have no clue of the sheer potential of it outside of those practices. I would need to thoroughly test out each game to find that out, and if I did that, this video would have come out much later. The firmware this keyboard runs is stated to have been built from the ground up by Wooting, which they call Tachyon Mode. In the Wootility, there is a current speed indicator that tells you the current input latency, which is approximately 3.4 milliseconds at the moment. When enabled, it supposedly optimizes every key on the keyboard for input speed by disabling all unnecessary processes like that disabling RGB to deliver the fastest possible input which is now approximately 1.4 milliseconds, just shy of that 1 millisecond input dang it, but is insanely fast nonetheless, possibly the fastest keyboard on the market to date. If you're really looking for low latency and quick inputs, this will really be up your alley for hardcore gaming. In my practice, all I can say is that it's fast. I mean, come on, we're talking about milliseconds here. Do you expect me, as a mere human, to know speed differences like that? Anyhow, the keyboard also periodically auto-calibrates to account for tolerances and different environments, which greatly benefits long-term consistency and performance. If you're wondering if there are any drawbacks from leaving it on on analog mode 100% of the time, don't worry, there isn't. Besides from the signal being slightly unstable, but nothing unusable. If you're interested, I'll leave a link to a thorough blog post that details the importance of input latency by Wooting. Another cool, unique feature to this kind of keyboard is what's called Dual Event Key Press, or Dynamic Keystroke as Wooting calls it. This has definitely come a long way from its initial build back from when the Wooting 1 was prevalent as you can see. But now, in the utility on your analog profiles, this allows you to bind up to 4 key combinations at different points on a single keystroke on any key. One at the start of the press, one at the end, and then twice more at the same positions on the upstroke. I hear that most people like using this for comboing actions in games. There are no timers, strings, or scripts that you need to set it up. It's a native input and is independent from any API, controller support, or PC software. Therefore, it's compatible with every game and application, so there shouldn't be any reason for you to get banned for this feature. How this works is you click and drag for how long you want the key to stay pressed, like so, or just indicate a specific point to activate it only once. Conveniently, you have a bind test section to help you with your setup right next to it, like so. Perhaps for example, in a game you're playing that doesn't support analog movement, you could work around with, with what's called false analog movement, like with one of these. Basically making a DKS binding that achieves actions like walking and sprinting both in one key. Like that. If you're interested in its potential, I'd advise visiting Wooting's help desk site or asking the community to learn more specific bindings. Unlike most other current gaming keywords with limited onboard memory, except say the Corsair K100, it features an outrageous 16 megabytes of flash memory to save settings and profiles onto the keyboard, which is what I would agree with others to be very overkill. However, they have stated plans to rework how profiles work within the utility, expanding the utilization of profiles for more than just four onboard profiles. Think of it more as future-proofing. Virtually unlimited keyboard storage and everything is saved onto the keyboard. No signing accounts or cloud required. Within the utility to the left, you can see an option to create your own personal analog profile or download one from the unofficial community-managed website called the Bootabase. 
Now, although you can find some on their knowledge-based site, it isn't as popular with profiles as the Wooter-based one. Here is where you can share and upload your own made profiles and scale the site for a profile you need simply needing to copy the code and paste it into the software to add it to the board and further configure it if needed. Like so. Again, if you're lucky, most of the work is already done for you. And don't worry about losing your profiles from being overwritten. When moving a profile from the software to the keyboard, it simply moves it back into the software's library. Like so. I might as well also mention that it has a 1000Hz polling rate, not needing to be any higher, full and key rollover meaning you can press down all the alphanumeric keys and they will all be registered, and anti-ghosting if you're so inclined to know. Within the utility, you are able to disable the end key rollover if you have a PlayStation or a really old motherboard if you want to use this on that. I'm gonna personally see if I can get it to work on a Switch OLED later when I get one. The software that I've repetitively mentioned throughout the video is available on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and it appears to have been designed with the consensus that people don't want to have to feel forced to download proprietary software with their hardware, and I can vouch for my experience. It isn't mandatory to have it installed, but even so, when you close it, it doesn't silently keep running in the background. You hear that, Razer? Then trust me, I would know coming from the Razer Naga Trinity with Synapse 3. The software is really only if you want to thoroughly configure and customize the keyboard, and it all saves onto the board once done anyway. However, it does take up 250 megabytes of disk space, and it can get as high as 308 megabytes of memory usage with 10% CPU usage. The high memory usage is apparently due to the software being an electron program. Other than that, it's really simple and easy to learn. I didn't need to scale for any tutorials at all. The load times are decently quick, and at the end of your desired configurations, always remember to save the keyboard. That's all. Really. Meaning there are no required account logins, no mandatory system restarts after updates, no constant internet connections required, and no annoying pop-ups during use. It's true tranquility. Just you, to the software, to the keyboard. No shenanigans. One of the remaining features I would like to highlight is the remap feature, something I haven't really seen a lot of other companies implement in their softwares. Yeah, rebinding keys on a keyboard isn't anything new, but the remapping here is insanely customizable and easy to follow along. Just see for yourself. With over multiple profiles and layers to add, anything from basic characters, extended characters, special characters and shortcuts, or you can just pick from one of their presets. Any Comac and the work users out there? You want dedicated multimedia keys instead of shortcuts, or perhaps the best of both? You can certainly make that happen with this. I would also like to add here, as I can't think of any other place to put this, that thanks to the Leica switches and the Wooting's analog SDK program, you can actually use the keyboard as a MIDI output device, aka a keyboard instrument much like a piano for example, so as to play a virtual instrument with a music creation software. Now this kind of feature is wasted and not applicable to me, but I'm sure if you ask someone in the community they will be able to tell you the potential of it. You can find out about the latest and greatest utility updates on their website which are thoroughly detailed and a pleasant read honestly. And if you at all run into any trouble, or are confused with everything I've told you, there is always support available from their help section on their website, their YouTube channel, and even from the lovely folks on Discord. By now you may be thinking, Bruto, you've gone on and on about how great this keyboard is. There has to be some things you can criticize it for. And you're right. While I have been giving this keyboard constant praise, there are undoubtedly a few negatives to this board. The big one I've heard a lot is a lack of macro support. Yes, this board doesn't have it, and they can be handy. But to be fair, DKS does function like a macro when looking at its functionality. But having said that, they have stated that they will work on macro support in the utility. However, I've heard that it's a low priority to them as better alternatives exist like auto hotkeys, which is fair enough. There's also the absence of no volume wheel, USB pass-through, or wireless and Bluetooth capabilities. You know, those luxuries. A volume wheel is certainly a very useful feature to change the volume on the fly though a space to put it would be lacking on this model at least. A USB hub preferably like the one on the Mount Everest keyboard, and wireless and Bluetooth capabilities to me at least would have been convenient and nice to have, though to be fair, with the USB pass-through it would make the cable no longer detachable and be a thick piece of work, but some people love that feature so I can understand. I would have liked to have seen the flip out feet flip outwards horizontally rather than vertically, just so you don't accidentally push over the keyboard in those quick, spontaneous movements with your hands. But honestly, it ain't a deal breaker to me. 
Lastly, there's also the lack of more available keyboard layouts with these switches, and additional switch variants like clicky and tactile available in the store. The different switch variants have been asked for before back when the Leco edition was announced, and they mentioned they would eventually manufacture tactile and clicky switches at a later date. And the best part about it is that when they are made, they will be useful with other Leco boards, so that's reassuring. The option for more keyboard layouts also seems to have been answered with the introduction of their Wooting 60HE, a 60% set to release after the HE, replacing the Wooting 1, so no TKL board unfortunately. With everything said and done, this is without a doubt a keyboard worthy of being called a gaming keyboard, because of its genuine gaming benefits, software that doesn't suck ass, and a wide range of features and customizability. It is very much on the high end side, costing around 300 Australian dollars alone when I bought it. But Wooting keyboards are not budget products, and this will be sure to last you a long time with features that aren't actually seen on a whole lot of other boards, especially from the big brands. For now, hopefully. The software is without a doubt one of the best for gaming keyboards. Need I show more? And Wooting have got some future plans down the line for the utility like auto profile and game detection and macro support. If any help is needed, just ask the community. The analog input is still arguably seen as a niche feature on keyboards due to the lack of acknowledgement by game developers, which limits its application and functionality on games. Like for some games, integration can be flawless, other times it can feel glitchy including the GUI bindings being buggy. Others may need a setting or two to to get it working, or at worst it's not possible at all, only allowing one input device, Call of Duty Warzone and Alien Isolation to name a few. But admittedly, this lack of universal support is kind of out of their hands, and it's really going to come down to spreading the word and increasing the competition, hoping to nourish this new technology that is possible on keyboards. A big thumbs up and highly recommend it. I love it to bits. This is going to be my permanent keyboard in my setup for most, if not all, my gaming needs until, I don't know, it malfunctions or Footing brings out an even better board that's even more advanced and packed than this one. That I cannot wait to see. They truly are a company worth of all the support they can get, and in turn, they give back more than they should. As Wooden themselves would say, with your contribution and our passion, together, we can continue making analog keyboards the new industry standard. The game is on.